Good afternoon, everyone. Very welcome. There are currently 47 of us that have logged on. I have just started recording so that everyone is aware of the fact that we're recording this particular session and it will be made available on the website, on the UCAS website and on YouTube uh, after, uh, after today sometime. <clears throat> We are going to tell you that you can perform susceptibility testing of common anaerobic species using disk diffusion testing. That will be the message of today. And we are myself, Erica Matashek and Jenny Orman from the EDL in Vecture, uh, Trevor Morris and Sarah Copsey Moore from the uh, reference unit in Cardiff, and Ulrich Steens Justusen. Uh, from the uh, Odense University Hospital of Clinical Microbiology in Denmark. <clears throat> this is the agenda. I will have a brief introduction, and then Trevor is going to talk to us about MIC testing <clears throat> using the reference agar dilution method, uh, followed by Erica, who will tell us everything about the disk diffusion test that has been developed, what are the limitations, and what are the what, what can we expect from, from the disk diffusion test? <clears throat> Ulrich is going to talk about the importance of anaerobicity, specifically when uh, testing uh, metronidazole. And then at the end, Jenny will tell us about quality control. Uh, and at the very end, we will have uh, a short discussion for anyone who is so inclined. Also to say, you can post questions in the chat during the presentations, and we will deal with those um, at the end of the presentations, and they can form a basis for a brief discussion. So without further ado, yes, that's exactly what I just said. So without further ado, <coughs> we will start this session on disk diffusion of selected anaerobic bacteria uh, and it has been a joint project between, between the EDL, between the reference unit in Cardiff, between many colleagues around Europe uh, who has have input, have had input on the development, um, and also many colleagues around Europe who have taken part in clinical laboratory trials to try to find out whether the method can actually be implemented in routine bacteriology uh, whether it's actually possible to read a manual, uh, look at the reading guide and get everything right. And the short answer to that is yes, it is possible. And if it hadn't been possible, we probably wouldn't have had this seminar today. So the currently used methods for AST of anaerobic bacteria, the reference method is agar dilution, at least in Europe. Uh, and it's agar dilution for all anaerobic species. Uh, in CLSI, you can use broth microdilution for bacterial no. stragulies. Um, if you're joining us, unmute, please. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, a lot of you use gradient tests for everyday routine susceptibility testing of anaerobes simply because you do not have any other means. And we'll come back to that later. Um, there have been attempts to uh, develop disk diffusion from uh, a number of committees over the years. CLSI used to describe one, BSAC had one, the reference group of antibiotics in Sweden had one, uh, and all of these have, for a variety of reasons, been abandoned, mostly because people felt they weren't trustworthy, and we'll come back to that as well. So what routine laboratories do today is either they perform a gradient test or they decline to do susceptibility testing of anaerobes or on request from colleagues refer anaerobic bacteria to a reference laboratory in their neighborhood somewhere, hopefully, uh, and ask them to perform um, the AST on that particular bug. As part of the current evaluation of disk diffusion and uh, simultaneously the performance of lots of agar dilution MICs, we've also decided to use the collection of organisms that we have put together 
and tested and retested and tested and retested and distributed to the 60 laboratories around Europe. So we know a lot about these strains and we're going to use that collection plus supplemented with selected other organisms to evaluate the performance of gradient tests currently on the market. And we hope to uh, present you with data during the spring of 2022. And it will form part of the continuation of this project because this is only halfway through. We need to add more agents and we need to add more species along the way. So we're sort of halfway through, but we feel that the five organisms that we have, or groups of organisms that we have currently um, validated the method for are so important in your everyday routine bacteriology that we did not want to wait uh, for the continuation. So I'll just make this make you aware of this article if you weren't already aware of that. It's from Ulri Schutz on antimicrobial resistance and susceptibility testing of anaerobic bacteria. And you can find it via the uh, via PubMed or that address there. <coughs> Um, part of that, there is a table one, for example, which uh, iterates what I just said, namely that agar dilution is the reference method, and it lists a few advantages and disadvantages, and Trevor will later on uh, rehash some of those advantages and disadvantages. Broth micro dilution, not really on in Europe, we do not, uh, we have no, no plans of developing broth micro dilution for anaerobes. MIC gradient diffusion method. Yes, there are gradient tests that can be used for anaerobic bacteria. And as I said, we will evaluate the performance of those. And then of course, for a long time, we have used uh, rapid beta-lactamase uh, disc uh, tests with color uh, changes to indicate the presence of a beta-lactamase. <laughs> Uh, Audrey says that disk diffusion tests should not be performed for anaerobic bacteria for the purpose of obtaining susceptibility results, as the results are inaccurate and do not correlate with agar dilution method. Uh, and, and she refers to that reference. <clears throat> so that wasn't really encouraging, but we decided to have a go anyway. And that's the beginning of the development of the UCAS disk diffusion susceptibility test method. And that development has now been going on for the better part of four years, I think. Um, we started that with Brucella blood agar, but we discovered that the variability of plates or agar powder from different manufacturers was greater than we were used to from other, other agars. So we wanted to get away from Brucella blood agar and we turned to FAA, um, which by then could be obtained from several manufacturers and which in our hands was um, much more, uh, much less prone to variation between the manufacturers than the Brucella blood agar that we bought. We also decided that one of the reasons for why this testing probably failed in, in, in the past was perhaps because development wasn't limited enough because there were uh, uh, the, the, the stringency of criteria, stringency of recommendations were perhaps not um, uh, rigid enough. So we decided to develop a test which was to be read after 16 to 20 hours, not 15, not 21, not 24, not 48, but 16 to 20 hours, which is very much the UCAST uh, methodology for other disk diffusion tests. Um, we will eventually extend recommendations to more agents, to more species, perhaps to longer incubation time, but all of those will be next step projects. And we are confident that we are now standing on a, a reliable, robust method for the five species, Bacteroides species, Prevotella species, Fusobacterium necrophorum, uh, Clostridium perfringens, and Clostridium, uh, sorry, uh, Cutobacterium acnes. These are the antibiotics which we have developed so far 
uh, sorry, the antibiotics we've developed so far is on another slide, and you will see it from Eric in a minute. These are the antibiotics that we're now planning to extend uh, the recommendations to during the first uh, half of 2022. So you can expect to have more agents, not more species, but more agents uh, available to you during 2022. This is what the table is going to look like. It, you can already now see it in uh, breakpoint table 12, which is on the website for consultation. And Erica will go through it to a, in a little bit more detail later on. So with that, I will hand over to Trevor uh, to talk about anaerobic MIC testing by agar dilution. Take it away, Trevor. Thanks, Gunnar. And uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are joining us from. Um, so I'm just going to take you through uh, MIC testing by agar dilution, um, which is a method that we've been using um, in Cardiff for quite some time now. Um, as Gunnar said, my name is Trevor Morris. I'm the lead scientist of the Anaerobe Reference Unit based here in the UK. Um, I think my colleague, Sarah Kopsimawa, is, is online. Um, and I have to say that uh, a lot of this work is uh, credit, um, credit to Sarah. Uh, so I will take you through our process and some of the pros and cons um, and some of the interesting um, developments that uh, have happened within the unit as a, as a result of this as well. Next slide, please. So the, the reference units uh, that I run um, is, has been involved in all of these aspects. Uh, over many years now. We primarily uh, focused on ID and AST, and certainly more so on, on um, AST nowadays um, due to the moldy and the, um, the advances in identification. We also have a, a clinical lead um, who can give um, clinical advice and uh, with a central uh, reference laboratory for Wales uh, in terms of all things C. diff. We have a, a large collection, which we've used some of for the purposes of this, um, this work alongside other colleagues. Um, and uh, we also provide a training course, um, which is uh, running in the UK, hopefully next year, COVID permitting. Uh, and we do a lot of uh, R&D as well. Next slide, please. So our, our methods um, in, in terms of uh, agar dilution, uh, we've been running this now since uh, 2016, um, and I think that probably is around well over over 200 times we've we run this now on a weekly basis. Um, Gunnar alluded to uh, Audrey's paper in terms of the, the advantages, and I'll just uh, elaborate on those a little bit. It's obviously the CLSI gold standard method for all anaerobic bacteria. Um, we use it, and we can use it for uh, monitoring trends over time. And I'll mention that a little bit more later. Um, it helps us identify unusual and unexpected uh, resistance patterns uh, and makes the data comparable across all institutions. And, and we've, we've managed to importantly get this um, ISO accredited or UCAS accredited to ISO 15189. Um, and I'll mention some more uh, detail around that uh, over the next few slides. There are challenges as, as Gunnar and Audrey have, have uh, highlighted is very labor intensive to perform and interpret. And it's only really suitable for um, laboratories such as ours um, who have the benefit of um, enough organisms to, um, to make it viable. Um, so yeah, it's, it was never intended as a, a routine method. So um, yeah, much more suited to our kind of um, setup. Next slide, please. Um, currently our panel, um, which, which may be, more UK focused than um, than anything else, particularly. Um, so this, the first line that we test on all all strains is is a combined panel, um, and obviously we don't uh, report the um, the vancomycin for the gram negatives, but we, but for ease of of actual processing, um, this is the panel that we that we have put together. We have an extended one for. Um, Cutobacterium and Propionic Bacterium acnes, and then we add additional agents there for the multidrug resistance gram negatives that we do often um, encounter are referred to us, and we can do others on request. Next slide, please. So in terms of practicalities, and um, uh, again, Sarah, uh, who would be uh, the one to attest to this, 
um, it does require time and expertise to set up and deliver. Um, and I, I don't think anyone should underestimate that. Um, there, there's been a lot of challenges um, that we've encountered uh, along the way. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's no, um, it, you would uh, be very much um, weary of, of setting it up without considering certainly um, the next two things uh, in some great detail. So the equipment needed, you know, we, we have a, a large anaerobic workstation that we use uh, pretty much solely for this, for this purpose. Um, and the space required not just for that, but also for the additional elements um, like the, the actual pouring of the plates um, and um, additional equipments as well, such as glass washers. And um, we've, we've managed to repurpose some, um, some equipments for the purposes of uh, actually stamping the agar, um, which has worked really well. Um, but again, may not be available to you um, in in other in other laboratories, and and the ISO accreditation, um, I can yeah I can honestly say that the the, the method that we use has been scrutinised um, to death. Uh, I have to say that uh, some of the some of the challenges that that accreditation process, um, you know, makes us consider. Uh, have have made it uh, hugely robust. Things like monitoring trends over time, etc., um, and and that's been a, a challenging but very worthwhile um, process. And and I will speak in the next couple of slides about some additional value that we've seen um, from incorporating this this process from within our within our workflow on a weekly basis. Um, certainly, in terms of clinical relevance. Uh, what, what it's allowed us to do in the UK is make the results available in a in a much more clinically relevant time frame. Um, so you get the results back within a week um, in the majority of cases if you send us a pure um, strain. Um, and it's led to other developments, which I'll mention over the next couple of uh, slides. Next slide, please. And so I, Gunnar has, has hinted on the... Um, the uh, developments using FAA, um, and the, and this is something that obviously we're very familiar with here. Um, it's been commonly used here for um, as our primary isolation media, um, for for decades, um, since it was developed in the 90s, um, by Lab M, and it's specifically designed for the cultivation of all anaerobes with all the growth factors that we that we currently add to um, brucella already included as part of the formulation which gives it you know a, a huge advantage um, and we're integrating this into our service in early 2022 next slide please um, so a couple of the impacts then the the publication here um, that we put together just demonstrates that um, you know the there is an overall increased uh, reduced susceptibility to most of those agents and comparing uh, to the year 2000 um, with a couple of years ago. Um, and that's obviously a worrying trend. So um, yeah, uh, thus the, the need to, to develop something that um, will allow clinical labs to, to monitor things um, more closely. Next slide, please. And as, as a consequence of this, we have put together a, a database of um, MICs, which we're very originally calling a RUMIC. Um, uh, and this is hopefully um, going to allow us to, to monitor trends uh, more easily over time. This is, this is going to be available, hopefully, um, as an electronic platform in the near future. Um, and is also, you know, already helping us to, um, to develop uh, things alongside our colleagues here. Next slide, please. Uh, so, and you can carry on clicking, um, Gunnar. So the, the the intention of this is to um, allow people to select antimicrobials, and um, to select um, whatever organism they want from our collection, which is huge now, um, and then select the time frame in by year, and then also the method because we've included um, there are some um, other methods involved in here. Uh, great egg dilution is our main method. Uh, and then um, if you if you click on apply and then it'll bring up the um, the distribution as you see here. Next slide. Thank you. And that's um, a whistle stop tour of uh, Ega dilution. It just leaves me with some acknowledgements there to my team. Um, Harriet, Michael, Sarah, Selena, Beth, Liam and Carol and uh, the, the, the wider Public Health Wales group, um, Robin Howe. Um, Mandy Whitten, 
uh, representing BSAC and uh, SACU and Trevor Reed from Informatics who's um, developed the Arumic database with us. So maybe to explain okay. Jolch, Jolch at the end. Ah, of apologies. Diolch, Diolch is thank you in Welsh. And Good. Yeah. I knew that, but I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't sure all the others knew that. So nope. <laughs> thank you very much, Trevor. Excellent. So that, that brings us to the next talk. And the next talk is by Erica. And Erica will then explain the distribution methodology. And she will also show a number of... Uh, uh, correlations between disk diffusion results and uh, agar uh, dilution reference MIC results. So take it away, Erica. Thank you. So if you change the slide, please. Um, as Gunnar already mentioned, when we developed the disk diffusion methods for, method for rapidly growing anaerobes, we focused on five commonly isolated anaerobic bacteria. Uh, and we also focused on some of the clinically relevant antimicrobial agents as, as a first step. Um, and you can see them here. Uh, the development of the disk division method for anaerobes uh, was performed in three steps. The first step was a work we did to investigate the effect of different parameters on the results. Uh, so actually on the growth and the zone sizes. We looked into fastidious anaerobe agar, FAA, from different manufacturers. Uh, we looked into inoculum size, incubation temperature, uh, if the results were affected by if we incubated how we achieved the anaerobic uh, environment for incubation um, and incubation time. Those results are now published in CMI. You can find the paper on the CMI website. The second step uh, has been to, would you change Gunnar? Uh, produce MIC zone diameter correlations for the five species that we selected. And for this, we performed a disk diffusion at the UCOS Development Lab, EDL, and MIC with agar dilution on FAA agar was performed in Cardiff, in Trevor's lab. Also in this part of the study, we included media from different manufacturers. We had both in-house prepared and commercial media, and we looked into different systems for generating the anaerobic environment. And then finally, as a third step, uh, we have performed a field trial where 16 laboratories in Europe participated and in the phase one study the labs tested a common collection of 35 isolates within these five species with known MICs and different levels of resistance and in the phase two the same laboratories now test local isolates uh, with the aim to find a few more resistant isolates or isolates very close to the breakpoint to fine-tune our breakpoints a little bit further. Can I just add, Erica, that the MICs were known to us, but not to the 60 laboratories. So they were they were blinded in that way. Sorry. Yes, that's correct. Uh, so this is the method that we uh, recommend for disk diffusion or rapidly growing anaerobes. The medium should be fastidious anaerobe agar with a supplementation only of 5% mechanically defibrinated horse blood. It's important that the plates have an agar depth of four millimeter as for all disk diffusion tests by EU cost. And it's also important to dry the plates before they are inoculated. The inoculum should be equivalent to McFarland one. And you should, as for other organisms, use an overnight culture from non-selective media. Incubation is in anaerobic environment for 35 to 37 degrees and for 16 to 20 hours. Um, and if we go a little bit more into detail uh, with, with the different parameters in the uh, method, we will start with the media, and then we know that the humidity of the FAA plates will affect the reading. If plates have excess humidity, there will be fuzzy zonages, and there will be probably more problems with swarming and also haze within zones. So it's very important to dry the plates prior to inoculation. It's also, uh, it might be important to know that in-house prepared plates are usually less humid and zones are usually easier to read on those plates. So if you can prepare plates in-house, that is not a disadvantage. If you use commercial plates, which are packed in plastic bags,
I don't know if you can hear me, Erica, but we lost you. The connection was interrupted. Let's see if Erica comes back on. I think the rest of you can hear me, can you not? Yes, Good. I can hear you, Gunnar. So we will wait to see if Erica comes back on. Uh, meanwhile... I am back again. Ah, it, the... Here she is. Good. Start all over with FAA Media. Yes, so let's go to the next slide. Um, for stricting of plates, it is as for other organisms that you have to do it a little bit different depending on the organisms. For these five species, it's only for bacteroides that you have to remove excess fluid by turning the swab against the inside of the tube before inoculating the plates. For the other organisms, you should just dip your cotton swab and use a wet cotton swab when streaking the plates. It's important to spread the inoculum evenly over the entire agar first surface and ensuring that there are no gaps between streaks. And this is particularly important for Cutibacterium acnes, which grows with small colonies and poor contrast on the FAA media. Uh, and this actually also applies to some species of Privatella. So if you have small colonies, then treat it with, streak your plates with a little bit more extra care to make sure that you have confluent growth. It is also important to limit the number of discs on each of the plates to allow good growth and also to avoid overlapping of zones. For Bacteroides, there are only, for now, breakpoints for four agents. These four discs can be placed into one plate. That works fine, but for Cutibacterium acnes and some of the other species, you have to limit the number of discs to three or maybe even to two discs per plate to be able to make sure that you can read uh, whole inhibition zones and have sufficient area for the bacteria to grow on. Um, and I will just mention the anaerobic atmosphere because Ulrich will talk more about that uh, in a short while. But it's important to know that the anaerobic atmosphere has to be checked regularly. And it's also important to know that if you work, use a workstation and you use that a lot during the day by adding and subtracting plates, um, that will affect the anaerobic atmosphere and it will then change over time and not be stable during that time. As I said before, the incubation time is 16 to 20 hours and the UCOS breakpoints and the UCOS criteria are only valid for 16 to 20 hours of incubation. That means that it's not uh, allowed to prolong incubation, not to 24 hours or not to the next day. This will affect the zone sizes significantly and it should not be necessary for these five species that we have developed the method for. Next slide, please. When it comes to reading of zones, we have, of course, some general instructions that are the same as for other uh, organisms and agents that are tested with disk diffusion. For the FAA plates, you have to read them from the front. So you have to remove the lid, read the zones from the front of the plate, and they should be illuminated with reflected light. You should hold the plate about 30 centimeters from the eye. And at four anaerobes, it's quite important to hold the plate at a 45 degree angle to the workbench to better define the zone edge. And then you measure your zone diameter at the point of complete inhibition as judged by the naked eye. But as you will see in the next slide, there are a few specific instructions for the anaerobes that will help you to read zones when it's a little bit more difficult. The first example is with a Bacteroides strain uh, and Meropenem, and this also occurs for other uh, anaerobic bacteria. Um, and if you have faint haze within the inhibition zone, uh, then you hold first hold your plate at the 45 degree angle to the workbench, but then you tilt it even more towards you. That will better define the zone edge and make it easier to read the most obvious zone edge. The second example is with swarming. Can you please change, Gunnar? Uh, which should be ignored when reading zones, which is similar to other organisms. I'm sorry, this is with hemolysis in the picture. So hemolysis and swarming should be ignored and you should read inhibition of growth. And the third example is with clindamycin, where it's very important to carefully examine the zones, zone four uh, colonies growing within the zone and those should be taken into account. So this example should be reported as six millimeter or no zone. 
But if you do that, if you carefully uh, examine your clindamycin zones, you don't have to incubate further belong, uh, beyond 16 to 20 hours to detect clindamycin resistance in these species that we have developed the method for. And then please change. Um, we have developed a reading guide specifically for anaerobic bacteria on FAA, where we have many more examples. And this is available on the UCOS website. Uh, and you can take a look there and you can also look at it and has the pictures on your screen to see more examples of pathisonides, haze, uh, swarming and hemolysis. And the next slide will show you where to find it. You go to ASTL bacteria then disk diffusion methodology, and then you have the documents for the standard disk diffusion test, and then below that, uh, the disk diffusion criteria for the anaerobes. So one document with the method and QC criteria in the same document, and another document, which is the reading guide. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is what a breakpoint table will look like. It will be valid from 1st of January next year, uh, but it is already a preliminary version available on the UCOS website. Uh, so instead of the old sheets for gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria, we will have one sheet for anaerobic bacteria, and there will be specific tables for the different species. So next slide, please. And there we also have uh, a few pictures with reading examples uh, and also Clostridiodes difficile is included here, here even if there is yet no disk diffusion test for that species. And the reason that we have this yellow background is not because we uh, love that yellow background, it's because everything is new here compared to last year. And that's the UCAST um, style is to mark anything that is new with the yellow backgrounds, just to explain uh, why we have this canary type of background. So I will now show you some examples of MICs, a correlation between zone diameters and MICs. So these are zone diameter distributions where the different colors of the bar correspond to different MICs. And if the MICs are in the susceptible range, the colors are green and red and orange correspond to resistant results. And the upper part graphs will show data from the EDL where we tested uh, EDL and then correlated to agar dilution MICs on FAA performed in Cardiff. And the lower graph with the same agent and species will show what happened when we tested isolates in the field trial phase one, where all the, uh, the labs tested the same isolates. Uh, we should say that at that time, when we performed the field trial phase one, all the labs were unexperienced with the disk diffusion of anaerobic bacteria. And after that, we have provided more clear instructions on example, how to read zones. But even that, even though the labs were unexperienced, it actually looks pretty good. Uh, when we compare the EDL data to the field trial phase data. This first example is for Bacteroides with Piperacil and Tazobactam. And um, the next example, Bacteroides and Metronidazole, where we see more uh, a very clear separation between susceptible and resistant isolates. Uh, the next example is for Privatella species and Benzyl penicillin, one unit. Again, a very nice separation between susceptible and resistant isolates. And you can see here that the field trial phase one results matches very well the EDL data. Um, and another example for Privotella with clindamycin, where isolates are either very susceptible or very resistant, uh, but again with reproducible result, results both at EDL and in the field trial. And in the next slide, you will see Clostridium perfringens, Piperacil and Tazobactam, a few resistant isolates, but those are nicely separated from the susceptible population. Uh, Clostridium perfringens with clindamycin. Here you see a susceptible population, a low level resistant population, and a high level resistant population. And again, these are also nicely separated, um, both contested at EDL and in the field trial. And as you can see, we have not uh, missed any clindamycin resistant isolates here. And then to my two final examples, which are for uh, species and agents where we don't have any resistant isolates. So that is also sometimes the case, Fusobacterium necrophorum and benzyl penicillin. 
and then Cutibacterium acnes with um, something with Piperacillin tasobactam. And as you can see here, we only have susceptible isolates. And one um, aim with a phase two study of the clinical trial was to try to find a few more resistant isolates to be able to fine tune our breakpoints a little bit more. Um, so that is something that we will work with also during 2022. So with that, I will leave over to Ulrich, uh, who will talk about the anaerobic environment. Can I just <clears throat> add while Ulrich gets um, into gear that one of the reasons why we're making this work, because some people will wonder why, why is it that this looks as if it will work when we have failed previously. And I think one of the reasons, there are several reasons, and we can go into each of those if you like, but one of the reasons is that the UK Steering Committee early on decided that there wasn't enough clinical data to allow putting breakpoints uh, all over the place. So we would have to try to identify wild type distributions and then put our breakpoints close to the wild type distributions. And that, that actually permits reproducibility to a higher degree than if we had put our breakpoints sort of all over the place or in the middle of the distributions or far from the distributions. So if someone is wondering, why do we make it work now when it didn't work previously? This is at least one of the explanations. The others being standardizing a number of, of uh, uh, criteria uh, uh, and recommendations for how to perform this. And the third reason is that we have limited us to um, a few species. Uh, we're not claiming to have developed a distribution method to which you can take any, <clears throat> any anaerobic species. Um, and so I think those are the three main reasons for, for why this is actually working. Now, Ulrich, over to you and uh, the testing of anaerobicity. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think I will just turn off my video so that they will not interfere. So, um, well, my name is Ulrich Stens Justusen and I'm a medical doctor. Uh, and a clinical microbiologist, and I'm going to talk about anaerobicity and how we test uh, anaerobicity. So uh, next slide. Yes, what, what is anaerobicity? Well, uh, that's the state of being anaerobic. It is also referred to as anaerobiosis, and that means existing in the absence of free oxygen. And that is absolutely essential for the cultivation of anaerobic bacteria. Um, we probably know that the susceptibility of anaerobic bacteria to lethal oxygen, uh, which is actually free oxygen radicals, is a continuum. And, and the definition of an anaerobic bacteria is not uh, absolutely clear. Uh, you will probably all know from experience that some uh, anaerobic bacteria will die at very low levels of oxygen, and some can grow at, at let's say, one or two percent of oxygen and not, not grow, but they will not die, but not multiply. Uh, however, a, a common feature of what we call anaerobic bacteria uh, is that they all grow significantly better in the absence of free oxygen. And in the case of antimicrobial susceptibility testing, it is vital that we have standardized and constant anaerob uh, anaerobicity to do reproducible AST. Next slide. So what are the consequences of non-anaerobicity? Well, um, depending on the level of oxygen, the, the result will go from absolutely no growth to poor growth or reasonable growth. Uh, and all these cases will have a huge effect on, for example, an antibiotic zone disc diameter. Usually, uh, poor growth will result in very large zones, uh, and uh, the result will be, uh, or the, the risk will be of overcalling susceptibility. Uh, in contrast, we have metronidazole, uh, which is dependent on the anaerobicity to be reduced to the active metabolite which, which kills bacteria. And if there are oxygen present in the atmosphere, this will not happen. And, and zone can become much smaller, uh, a phenomenon that we call pseudo-resistance. Next slide. 
So uh, as I've hopefully made clear, it's important that we have anaerobicity to, to both culture and do susceptibility testing of anaerobic bacteria. And how, how do we test anaerobicity? Well, you probably all know the redox indicators such as resazerine or methylene blue. Uh, uh, the color, a color change to no color will uh, imply that there's no oxygen present in the uh, atmosphere. Uh, especially resazerine is very sensitive, uh, easy to work with and, and uh, inexpensive. And it can't actually switch color uh, a, a few times from uh, red to white and, and back again if, if the, uh, the, the small paper is still uh, uh, moist. Uh, however, it, it will dry out at, at some point. And of course, uh, it will only show the present atmosphere and not what has happened over time in the atmosphere. So next slide. And then there are oxygen monitors and usually they're only uh, for uh, anaerobic workstations. You cannot fit them into a box or a, or a, or a jar. Um, and of course they can show you the, the, uh, the present atmosphere, not over time, but usually you can install an alarm and, and it, will, it will make you uh, aware if oxygen levels are, are uh, above uh, zero. However, usually if, if you have uh, the small oxygen monitors, uh, accuracy can be a problem. With, with this specific product, it is plus minus 0.5%. And uh, if the monitor is saying zero uh, percent of oxygen and it's actually 0.5, I believe you will have very big problems with growing a, a lot of anaerobic bacteria in your atmosphere. So th that can be a problem, of course. You can get very expensive monitors uh, and they will work uh, quite well, but still only for uh, workstations. So next slide. Yes, and then there's this method, which is uh, the anaerobic growth indicators used by many. Uh, you use a very strict anaerobic bacteria, such as some uh, Clostridium difficile and uh, or Fusobacterium nucleatum. Uh, if they grow, uh, you can be pretty uh, sure that you have uh, a very good anaerobic atmosphere. However, uh, if there are no growth on your plate, uh, interpretation can be a diff bit, bit difficult. Uh, it could be a result that you did not put any bacteria on your plate. And also you cannot really say how, how much oxygen was present in my, in my, uh, in my incubator or jar uh, when I performed my, uh, uh, my tests. So it has also some, some drawbacks, uh, this type of uh, control. So next slide. So UCAST has tried to implement, implement a new principle for uh, uh, testing anaerobicity. Um, it's actually an old method, uh, but, but it, makes, uh, it uses an error tolerant Clostridium perfringens. And it can grow uh, at 4% at uh, of oxygen and even higher. And as you can see on the picture, top left, that is 0% of oxygen. And bottom right, that is 2% of oxygen. And, and as you can see from the plate, growth is actually uh, very strong, still at 2% at of oxygen. However, as you can see, there's a disc on the plate, and that is metronidazole. And uh, uh, with increasing levels of oxygen, the metronidazole zone diameter will decrease. And that is actually a, a very, very sensitive method. And this method is, is uh, just by using the standard uh, methodology, UCAST methodology for anaerobic bacteria with a McFarlane 1 suspension on FAA and incubating for 16 to 20 hours. Uh, next slide, please. And here uh, you have a very nice demonstration of the principle uh, you should not pay attention to the metronidazole zone diameters because this is a bit different methodology, but it, it makes a very uh, uh, nice presentation of the, the principle that with increasing oxygen levels, the metronidazole zone is decreasing. And with the UCAST methodology, you can see a reduction uh, in zone diameter, zone diameter from around 30 millimeters to 22 millimeters at 0.16% uh, uh, of oxygen. So it's very, very sensitive. And if you obtain a confluent growth on a, on a plate uh, and a 
zone diameter above or equal to 25 millimeters, you can be quite sure that you have, uh, have had very good anaerobicity uh, during your incubation. And this is just a, a, a figure showing you uh, how well it uh, can be implemented in other laboratories. This is from uh, the field trial. And this is reading of that exact strain uh, in, in 16 different laboratories. As you can see, there's a nice distribution with a median around 29 millimeters. And most of all the readings are above the target or equal to the target. So, so the field trial was, was done with very good anaerobicity. Yes, I think that was it from me. So um, with that, thank you very much. Um, I will hand over to Jenny, who will now talk to you about quality control of disc diffusion of anaerobes. So go ahead, Jenny. Thank you, Gunnar. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to testing the anaerobic atmosphere with the aerotolerant Clostridium perfringens strain, we need to also test uh, the testing performance. And for that purpose, UCAST recommends one gram negative and one gram positive QC strain. It's the Bacteroides fragilis, ATCC25285, and the Clostridium perfringens, ATCC13124. And all of these three QC strains should be included at each test occasion or at least four times a week. Next, please. Just to remind us that the internal quality control will control not only the materials and equipment used, such as the discs, the plates, the incubators, but also control the testing procedure to see that the methodology is adhered to. And as with any standardized uh, methodology, it's very important to strictly adhere to the methodology without any modifications as the change of any parameter will also change the end result. When testing the QC strains, you should use a fresh overnight culture of the QC strain and use the same testing procedure as for the clinical isolates. And it's important to evaluate the QC results before you report any AST results for your clinical isolates. And for that purpose, UCAST has developed QC criteria uh, as earlier mentioned, they are available in the UCOST manual for distribution of anaerobic bacteria as targets and ranges. Next. Here are the tentative QC criteria, and the range is the acceptable limit set to allow for some day-to-day -day variation in the laboratory, and the target value is the midpoint of the range. And with repeated testing of the QC strains over and over again, you should end up at a mean value close to the target value. And these tentative QC criteria were developed with FAA media from two manufacturers and in anaerobic incubation uh, from both workstations, gas generating envelopes and the anoxomat system. Next. Here are some background data for setting the QC criteria. This is Bacteroides fragilis and Piperacillin tasobactam with a range of 29 to 35 millimeters. In the graph, uh, upper graph to the left, you can see data from the EDL and the dotted lines represent the QC range. And the two lower graphs represent data from the field trial to the left from phase one and to the right phase two data. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, laboratories were unexperienced with this methodology in phase one, but after phase one study, we gave individual feedback on the results and gave also the reading guide for guidance on how to read zone diameters. And we can see that the results from phase two were really improved when most results were actually within range. Next. So this is Bacteroides fragilis and Meropenem. And again, we can see that uh, the results were improved for phase one, uh, from phase one to phase two with a more narrow distribution after giving guidance on how to read the zones. Next is Clostridium perfringens QC strain with benzyl penicillin, one unit. 
uh, and very easy sound diameter to read, a very nice and narrow distribution. And comparing this distribution uh, to QC strains uh, of aerobic bacteria, such as E. coli and Staph aureus, these look really good uh, and very similar to what we see for aerobic QC strains. Next is uh, Clostridium perfringens with meropenem 10 microgram disc. And you can see that the results from the phase one study uh, gave a bimodal distribution. And this was caused by uh, thin growth within the meropenem zone, uh, leading some laboratories to read the inner zone and some read the outer zone. But after having seen the reading guide and guidance on how to read the outer and most obvious zone edge, we managed to get almost all results within uh, QC ranges for phase two. Next. And altogether, these are the results for phase one and phase two of the field trial. And we can see that overall 87% uh, of results were uh, within QC ranges for phase one. And for phase two, 99% of zone diameters within range. And these are uh, more than 1,000 zone diameters read at 16 laboratories, and they use different systems for anaerobic incubation. So it looks really good. Next slide. If your QC results are out of range, you should troubleshoot and uh, investigate for potential sources of errors before reporting your clinical isolates. And you should consider uh, different sources of errors, such as the discs, the FAA plates, uh, anaerobicity or reading difficulties, and also to make sure that uh, the methodology is uh, strictly followed as described. Last of all, uh, some advice on how to introduce the method in the laboratory. First of all, you have to make sure that your anaerobic incubation is uh, sufficient to be used for disc diffusion testing meaning that uh, the temperature should be 35 to 37 degrees, and you should make sure that testing with a metronidazole disc and the aerotolerant clostridium perfringen strain produces results that indicate uh, sufficient anaerobicity. And you need to find FAA plates uh, with a correct agar depth. They could be produced in-house or bought commercially. And if you by commercial uh, FAA plates, you should make sure that there are no other supplements or additives except from the horse blood. You need to do some training of staff, both in theory and in practical work. And uh, we strongly recommend you to start with uh, practicing on the QC strains. And if you can get the results for the QC strains correct, you will most likely also get um, accurate results for your clinical isolates. And we advise you to use the reading guide uh, to guide you on how to read sound diameters. As this can be sometimes difficult uh, when introducing the method. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I think um, looking at these slides is really important. It shows you that, first of all, there a lot of work was put into defining the QC ranges. You can see that the EDL used 147 determinations to produce that graph. And then a lot of work was put into the field one, field phase one trial <clears throat> from, from labs that weren't very experienced. And then a lot of work was put into um, telling them, you know, what was probably wrong and, and how to get it right. And then they, we can show that they actually managed to get it right. So if, 16 laboratories around Europe can get it right. And you saw several, several of these and you, all of them speak the same language, namely that if you do what you're told to do, uh, you can get it right. And I think that's, um, that's a very important message that it is possible to make this work, but you have to follow the recipe for how to make it work. And this is not one of those areas where you choose to express your personality. You will have to do that in dancing or singing or some other exercise. So with that, uh, we open now for questions. 
And if there is a graph you would like to have a look at again, we can flip backwards because all of our present presented graphs and, and, and uh, pages are in the same presentation. So it's easy to flip back and forth here. I don't see any questions in the chat actually. Uh, so we have nothing to start with. So you will have to unmute and speak up. <clears throat> I think the troubleshooting um, is very important to get right and understand what can actually go wrong. Um, and you need to think about um, the various components of the test. And I could see that Audrey raised the hand. So please, Audrey, take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, this is fantastic work what a lot of work this must have been. And I just applaud you all, all of you. It's, it's um, just delightful to see all thank of you. Thank you, Audrey. <laughs> thank yes. you. Well, thank, thank you. So um, questions about the testing process itself. So I assume that the laboratories, the field, laboratories that were doing this, the phase one and phase two, um, those labs who were reading these disks uh, are also, or the sections of the labs were special sections, I'm assuming. I'm assuming these are say, labs that are also reading anaerobic, I'm sorry, aerobic disks, et cetera, as well. So they're kind of learning a new process or were these done at special sections of each of the labs? I don't know if Jenny or Erica say, would like to answer that. Yeah, I, I think that uh, we don't know exactly for all of the 16 labs, but most of the 16 labs uh, that were um, participating in the field trial were just standard clinically clinical microbiology labs. Some of them have, have an extra or uh, additional interest in anaerobic bacteria, and some might have some uh, reference functions in anaerobic bacteria, but not all of them. So I think uh, they were mainly just standard clinical microbiology labs, but most of them have experience in disk diffusion of other organisms. Okay, and thank you. And Jenny had mentioned that there were a variety of different anaerobic environment setups at these labs for the QC. And is that also the case for the, um, the non-QC organisms, the isolates? I would assume. Yes, we included uh, anaerobic incubation in different systems uh, for producing both QC criteria and setting the clinical breakpoints. So it was a mix of workstation from different companies and gas generating envelopes from different manufacturers and um, an oximet system, etc. Thank so you. Have, May I continue yeah. with questions? Better, yes, or can. Do you, go on. Oh, thank you so much. Um, uh, reproducibility data, do you have, uh, I might have missed it, but do you have reproducibility data on the field data uh, as well, not just for the, of course, the QC organisms? Yes, we have that. So for the okay. field trial phase one, where the 16 laboratories tested the same 35 isolates, we also have specific looked into each of the isolates. So Batroid is isolate one. What was the reproducibility and variability for, for Piptaso, for Meropen, and for Clindamycin, and for Metronidazole? So yes, we have that data. And uh, usually it looks really good. And both for susceptible Y-type isolates and for those that are resistant. Oh, wonderful. And the other thing we did, Audrey, was that we we uh, we took the QC strains and mixed them into the um, the collection of isolates that the labs uh, that were part of the phase one trial uh, were supposed to test as blind isolates. So they didn't they got the QC strains as QC strains, but they also got them as clinical strains. So we could compare what they what the results were on the QC strains when they tested them as QC strains, but also what the results were if they tested them as clinical strains, because all the strains were blinded to them. So they just got number one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. So therefore we have a pretty good um, 
a take on their um, acuity and reproducibility. Very smart. Nice. Very um, devious. Uh, yes, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I think for now, one of my, um, the last question I have is, um, Piperacil and Tazobactam for Bacteroides that you showed, a bit problematic for the phase one as far as the range um, of testing. Now, um, were these um, antimicrobials tested um, sequentially in different phases by the labs? Uh, for instance, was Piperacil and Tazobactam one of the first sent out to the laboratories or was phase one really inclusive of all of the different bug drug combinations? It was the latter. So mm -hmm. they just got the collection and they tested all the agents at the same time. So I think that this is probably just more um, a result of Piptazo being a bit difficult and with different enzymes being expressed differently. And what we can say also, if you compare the upper graph, the EDN data with the lower graph with the phase one data, is that for the phase one clinical trial, we had also intentionally included many isolates close to the breakpoint. So that is a, an, a more challenge uh, collection of isolates. So that is why you also have more results between 12 and 18 millimeters here, for example, that we intentionally included those isolates among the 12 isolates that were tested. Uh, but if you look at the EDL data, where we in total had 170 uh, isolates, um, you can see that those are much, uh, there are fewer uh, results in that area. Yes, we knew this would be a potentially difficult one. So we wanted to provoke the, um, the method as much as we could. And what you're looking at is a result of that provocation. There are now two questions in the chat. Yes, so um, um, one of them was, uh, the first one was actually, uh, if sensitive, meaning I think that if there is no beta-lactamase or anything else, can we use the benzyl penicillin disc result to infer sensitivity to Coamox and Piptazo and Mero? And um, the answer to that, uh, I've already included there, and I've said most probably, but it's one of those things that we're now looking at. Uh, so I will not promise that at this point in time, we want to look into it, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if that would be the end result of things. And then there is um, another question. I'm unsure about the time the plates have to be in the right anaerobic medium. This is a problem in our workflow. How do you all manage this? So the time you need to target is 16 to 20 hours. And I suppose uh, the answer to that question is that you have to time your the beginning of your incubation so that you can take them out of the thermostat, out of the workstation, out of the uh, jars or whatever at the right time, namely a, a target 16 to 20 hours. Erica, Jenny, do you want to add question, anything? Yeah, the question maybe relates to when you're actually performing the susceptibility testing procedure. And then it's just our standard recommendations that you should use your inoculum within 15 minutes of preparing it, streaking the plates within 15 minutes of preparing the inoculum suspension, and then putting the plates back in, into the anaerobic environment within 15 minutes. But then, of course, if you have incubated your the strains that you're going to test, those should probably be kept in the anaerobic environment as long as possible before you perform the test. But then when you perform the procedure, there is no problem having them out in, in room temperature. Glad you added that, Erica. And yeah, then there is a, a question about why use two different clostridium strains to control uh, uh, to quality control and anaerobicity control. And uh, that's a good question. The one is targeted specifically for anaerobicity control and really nothing else. And we don't have all the data on that strain that would have been needed for that strain to, um, um, to, to serve as a, a AST quality control strain. And the amount of work that goes into that is quite substantial. And the other strain, the other clostridium uh, the other clostridium strain, 
is just not suitable for uh, checking anaerobicity. So, so you're sort of in, in between a rock and a hard place. And I think it's the other way around as well, because we have looked into the strain, which is recommended to test anaerobicity as uh, to be used as a regular QC strain. And it doesn't work because it usually gets colonies within the zones and you don't get reproducible results. So that have been considered, but it didn't work out well. So we had to choose two different Clostridium strains for this. And yes, the slide deck will be uh, shared. <clears throat> will be shared, and uh, it I will uh, share it in the same place that we will share the recording of this um, online seminar. Um, and you should expect it sometime tonight, probably. And about ATU, there there are no ATUs currently planned, uh, which doesn't mean that there couldn't be an ATU in the future. But right now, uh, as far as I can remember, we haven't planned for an ATU uh, in any of this. Erica, can you correct me if I'm wrong? Are you muted? You're muted, Erica. You are muted. I can see you, but we can't hear you. Now you're here. No. I didn't. I wasn't planning to say anything. OK, good. We were just looking into the chat <laughs> yeah, to okay. make sure that we didn't miss any questions. Yeah, Sorry. OK, good. So no ATUs at, at this point in time. Anything else? So I think one of the most important things right now is to start practicing with the uh, Clostridium perfringens anaerobicity test strain with the QC strains, and also to contact your suppliers of plates if you do not make your own plates and start asking them for FAA plates for AST, not FAA plates for culturing anaerobic bacteria, uh, because you don't want those plates. They are not necessarily correct in agar depth or in content, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to make sure that they can produce plates for AST for you. And um, and you might as well start asking now because it may take some time before your local supplier will be able to supply you with these plates. We know that there are suppliers, several suppliers that will supply these plates. Um, the State Serum Institute Diagnostica will do that. Uh, I think Oxoid will do that. And uh, maybe Eric and Jenny or Trevor can help me out. ENO will do that, I think. Is that right, Trevor? Yeah, ENO can produce them as well, yeah. yeah. And um, I think by connections in the UK as well. Yeah. Um, found, uh, yeah. And oxide plates by Thermo Fisher, as you said, yeah. and SSI Diagnostic in, in Copenhagen. Uh, there is a question in the chat also if there is a distributor in the US or Canada. Um, I honestly don't know. I don't think we do. I would say not yet. Okay. But when people start asking for things, suppliers have a tendency to uh, to start wanting to uh, produce and supply. So I think it's important to start asking them now and then uh, look very surprised when they say they can't and say that uh, you just took for granted that they will. Uh, there's a question from Audrey uh, about phase one and phase two. So phase one was the challenge set. So we sent out a challenge set to all the participants. Phase two, they were asked to use their now um, gathered experience and then to look into their hearts and their freezers to find those organisms, still those five species, but find those organisms that they find would find very interesting, that they were wondering about whether they were resistant to this or that, whether they, maybe they had one they had stashed because of metronidazole resistance or you know whatever, something they found interesting. And to test them with the new methodology, save all the strains that they used for the test, send us the test results, and we will then analyze the test results from those 16 laboratories, 25 strains each, roughly five for each species. And we will ask them for the strains that we find especially interesting 
um, so that uh, Cardiff and Trevor and Sarah can do MICs with agar dilution on these, and we can we can sort of pitch those into these distributions to enrich the distributions that you're now looking at. Um, and in this way, we will learn a lot, and the participants will learn a lot, and the system will be enriched. Does that answer your questions? Yes. Thank you. Anyone else? If you felt this was really fun, you can join us again at four o'clock and you can do the whole thing all over again, or you can look at the recording later tonight or possibly during the weekend or whatever. So it was great having you all on board. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Eric and Jenny, of course, and Trevor and Ulrich. Um, and I will send a thank you to my three dogs who have been very quiet, thankfully, during the whole presentation. So that's good. And uh, see you soon again. Bye for now. See you all soon. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat>